I'm presenting today, as uh, it was just mentioned, repurposing FDA-approved drugs for new developmental disorders. Um, my group has been supported by Fraxa since 2010 to the present time. Uh, we suggested to Fraxa in 2013 to create some sort of a Fraxa DVI, which is a drug validation initiative, and. Um, and now we are doing exactly the same for the Pete Hopkins Foundation USA, both of them. Um, so in my group, we have the luck to count with um, Dr. Robert Deacon for, with over 40 years experience in mouse behavior, in rodent behavior. So what we do is we receive a mouse, we phenotype this animal and we create a specific um, uh, behavior battery for that mouse in order to get as much as possible as an outcome measure. Um, this year we published several uh, things about, well, from the one that I have been asked to present today on chronic bryostatin uh, treatment of the FMR1 KO mouse. Um, so we, we also published, and I wanted to mention this because it has to do with the next slide, um, uh, using the FMR1 knockout mouse as a mouse model uh, with University College London on cannabidoid-like compounds. And it was also very successful. We published that in Brain. Uh, and then we also uh, designed and, and, and ran the preclinical trial for the phosphodiesterase inhibitor for a Tetras uh, pharmaceutical that is the most successful clinical trial so far in uh, uh, clinical in, in fragile X syndrome, improving language and learning. Uh, we also develop and um, are very interested in parallel to the mouse behavior to also run uh, constantly my, um, uh, biomarkers. So we published this year the GAT uh, microbiome uh, study in fragile X syndrome mouse and a lipidomic study in adults and children with fragile X syndrome in collaboration with the University of Montreal. So it was just introduced, so I'm going to go pretty fast on this, on the fragile X syndrome, because it's not particularly specifically related to, to this talk, that, uh, that just mainly to mention the people with fragile X syndrome. CGG repeats uh, more than 200 and that makes them not to have the, the, the protein that is very important for, for the studies. As I mentioned, we tend to run behavioral studies in, in conjunction with some biomarker, for example, neuronal spines. That it, this is a biomarker present uh, in many neurodevelopmental disorders related to autism that is immature neuronal spines, as you can see here, more like a um, phylopod, kind of very thin, rather to be these um, spines prepared for a synapsis. Um, another point important to take him on board today, perhaps, uh, and for me, perhaps it's the most important one when you start with, with preclinical studies, um, is that fragile X syndrome, like even I can say Pete Hopkins and many others, uh, has I primarily, for example, as it was started with MGLUR5 uh, in fragile X syndrome, GABA, etc. But we know today that there are many, many, many pathways involved like GSK3, APP, including which are uh, pathways related to, to uh, Alzheimer's um, and many other pathways. So perhaps it's not a case of a single drug, but a multi-drug approach to this type of syndromes. And this is very important. So you see a single drug having an effect, another single drug, different pathway having an effect, but perhaps the best way to target these syndromes is to using a combination studies. And we have been running this with Fraxa and the Pete Hopkins Foundation for the past five years in order to, to find a cure for these diseases. So um, starting with a presentation today on bryostatin, uh, which is a very interesting uh, 
molecule because it has been run, uh, running for a long time and is targeting uh, protein kinase C and NMDA uh, receptors as well, which is related to Grim syndrome. Uh, for this study, we wanted to know particularly because many times you, you take a compound preclinically and when you said preclinically, it's very important because what we are trying to design and understand is how to get outcome measures for a clinical trial and therefore it's very important that our preclinical study is well designed and the outcome measures very well understood. That's why we run specific batteries of behavior that we are trying to use in order to help translation. So for in, in this particular case, it, it was our interest and the pharma company working with us to understand whether a chronic study of five weeks or 13 weeks would make a difference. Um, so for the study, we use 10 mice per group, and usually we, we run them in um, uh, uh, just that P60, which means an adult mouse. Um, so we we found in here that this first uh, image will show you that the Ephrasia mice are very hyperactive compared to the wild types. And so we put them inside a box called the open field and we let them run for uh, three or five minutes, depending on the protocol. And then we'll see that the fragile X mice are super hyperactive and they move much more than a wild type mouse. And in this study, we take the mouse out and then we measure short term memory as well as the hyperactivity. And in T3 means that we return the mouse to the same box. Uh, 24 hours later, and we measure if this animal remembers being there. So this is this is done for long-term memory. Um, so we can see that the fragile X mice are not very good, not yeah, in the open field itself at the distance, and, and not uh, remembering the open field at, at uh, 10 minutes or uh, 24 hours. So when we run the study at five weeks, we see we saw no differences. So this compound would have come out as not useful in fragile X for reducing the hyperactivity. But when we kept going for a longer chronic study, we saw interesting interesting differences in this compound improving uh, short yeah short term memory. Um, so then we ran another another set of tests of daily living, meaning activities that the mouse normally do, and the fragile X mice uh, drastically fail on them. This, uh, together with marble bearing that I will present uh, immediately, is an activity totally dependent on hippocampus. So if you remove the hippocampus, the animals won't run this task. But they are activities that the mice enjoy doing, so it's very easy to do them in any lab. So you measure as one, the incapacity, one to two, three in the middle to, for the animal to make a nest, and four and five as a very good nest being formed. Um, so we see that the FMR1 mice are very bad at making this uh, task, and, and we saw that this is absolutely recovered by treating the mice at uh, 13 weeks rather than at five. So we also don't see uh, differences when we make the mice to uh, bury marbles, which actually is something they have no idea they're doing. They're just enjoying digging, and by the process of digging, they are burying marbles. This is a, also a very simple test to be run into in, in any lab and is uh, also hippocampal dependent, and it's uh, very clear in the fMR1 mice that they have this uh, incapacity to, to perform this task. Now, when we treated the animals five weeks or 13 weeks, we uh, already saw the importance of extending this clinical trial because we saw no effect at uh, five weeks, yes, at uh, three weeks. So last, we uh, tried to understand if there was an improvement in uh, learning and memory. And so we ran something called fear conditioning, where you give a mouse a context, which is OK, and then you give them a context when they are very badly uh, having a very bad experience. And, uh, and then you return the good context and then the bad context, and they should have learned which context is associated with a bad, having a bad time. So they freeze. 
So this is why we are measuring uh, the percentage of freezing in five minutes after they are presenting with this abrasive context. And again, the treatment of 13 weeks, we cover the animals completely so the animals learn and remember the context rather than that five weeks. So if we would have run this test, this several test and um, preclinical study at five weeks, we would have considered that this compound has no chances in fragile X syndrome. So this indicates how important it is when you're running a preclinical study to pay attention, not just to, you know, of course, the concentration, but the timing you are considering for the compound of interest. So as a summary, uh, well, it's just what I just um, said. And one important point of running these tests at 13 weeks of a long chronic study is because many times with NGLUR inhibitors, we saw a uh, difference, a rescue at a acute doses, meaning uh, one dose or very short trials. But when these compounds have been used in a chronic situation, meaning giving the compound for a long period of time, they they become tolerant and they don't respond anymore. So it's very important that we understand a compound in which conditions, you know, how the, the compound will respond to then have a, a, a good uh, clinical trial chances. Um, so for bryostatin one, that they are now starting a clinical trial in fragile X syndrome, we understood that a long-term treatment would result in further improvement in fragile X than a shorter treatment. So the other, uh, the last slide is just to acknowledge the Fraxa Research Foundation, US the uh, medical director of Fraxa and also also an author in this paper, Daniel Alcon, David Coldcroft, and uh, and uh, Professor Sun, which are all from they are all from uh, Neurotrop Biosciences, a pharmaceutical company developed by Statin One, and who support part of this work, particularly Fraxa support all the work. Uh, Dr. Robert Deacon from Oxford, uh, Mike. Curly from UCL, Francisco Altimiras from uh, my lab, uh, and they all made this uh, work possible. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Patricia. Can you stop sharing your screen now, if yes. you don't mind? Yes. Um, so thanks again, Patricia. We, because of time constraints, um, Ilsa, uh, we've got about less than 10 minutes to do a presentation. So we won't have time to, to have any questions, I think, between these talks. Ilsa, do you think you can try and do an abbreviated presentation on your I work? I can try. I can go over a few things because uh, sure. some things were already uh, mentioned. So good afternoon, everybody from uh, Montreal, Canada. And I'm going to talk about metformin. Uh, Clarissa is playing with my screen. So uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So this is, uh, you see the little three boys here and a mother with her child and all the childs uh, in this picture have actually fragile X syndrome. And fragile X syndrome has a frequent, a high frequency, it's X length, it's uh, transferred through the mother. And uh, one of the uh, big, uh, it's uh, one of the big features is intellectual disability, but uh, several years ago, not that long time ago, they also related it to autism spectrum disorder. And you see the three boys, they have problems, and that's typical for autism spectrum disorder too. They're, they're gazing away, they, they can't have communication contact, they have problems with speech, uh, they have repetitive behavior, which is hand flapping. Well, many of the females don't pronounce that that much. So the, fem the, the little girl that you see with the mother is nearly, let's say, normal, much less affected than the males, although we are looking more and more now into also looking into females. So in the next slide, I'm not going to go over that since I'm time uh, a bit time delayed, but uh, it's just fragile X and it's the same with autism spectrum disorders. There's so many different features and patients are very different from each other that we need to start working versus cures for every uh, type of patient, basically. So, um, and next slide. 
and so we have the Fragilix uh, knockout mouse, and um, I'm not going to go over everything, but what we can do in mice models and also in autistic mice models, which genes related to autism, we look at specific behaviors related to the disease, and we can look at, like Patricia said, learning and memory, but we also look at seizures, hyperactivity, very autism related is definitely social behaviors and repetitive behaviors. We look at uh, altered neuronal morphology and uh, partially what my lab is uh, very, or what our lab is very involved in is also like, Derek did a nice introduction there. We look at downstream targets uh, in protein translation. What protein translation means um, in the next slide, I think. Yeah, so you see, it's a very, busy slides and I don't want to go totally over it, but the pathways you see here are pathways that are involved in when exactly an mRNA goes into protein and the very distinctive pathways. And uh, it's, it's very cell specific also in the brain where what happens. And we look in those pathways at the different markers and uh, what we know in Fragile X, for instance, and in lots of autism diseases that those pathways are hyperactive. So you get too much protein uh, translation, basically. You get too much protein into the brain. So um, in the next slides, yeah. So, and we know in ASD, in autism spectrum disorder, including Fragile X, these pathways are really uh, impaired. So we were looking into it and we thought like, hey, there is higher protein translation. So how can we work with that to maybe help with that protein translation to diminish it and uh, actually put it down and see what's happening into the brain mostly. We also looked in peripheral tissue, but what's happening into the brain and if we can alter it um, when we can bring brain proteins to a normalization compared to uh, normal uh, uh, individuals or normal uh, mice, uh, if we can actually adjust the behavior. So uh, in the next slide, you see that um, uh, maybe you can click a few times, Clarissa. Yeah, sorry. So. We had, uh, we studied metformin in cancer and all that. It, metformin has been studied in many diseases. It's uh, like Derek already introduced. It's an FDA approved drugs that was used for uh, diabetes. But what it does, the two pathways I, uh, I, I told, that, told just before, they're hyperactive. And we know that metformin works, works on those pathways to actually make them less active. So it uh, it's, it does an inhibition of those two pathways. So we thought if we can inhibit those pathways, what will be the effect? And it's not only on Fragile X, it's also on other autism spectrum disorders that we uh, study in the lab. So um, next slide. So what we did, uh, we did a study before that was published uh, about three years, three and a half years ago, where we worked with adult animals where we did injections of metformin and had very good outcome. And I will talk about clinical trials and case studies later. But one of the newer stuff we did is uh, because uh, the good thing of, of metformin is uh, it's been studied in kids a lot because of the diabetes. And it's been taken chronically from like six years old till an end of life, basically, and it's it doesn't have much side effects. Uh, you just have to build it up. So what we did is, um, and it's a very dissolvable drug in water. So we gave it through the drinking water of pups. Like how we did it is uh, the mother gets the pups and then we give the drinking water with the metformin in and the pups drink the milk of the mother that already has the metformin. And then we treat them for several weeks until their adult stage. And we used the doses that for a mouse related to a human. And then we, we treat until seven, eight weeks old and we start behavioral testing uh, afterwards and we see what the effects are. So next slide. So just, I'm not going to give very uh, big biochemistry slides. So I just wanted to say the pathway on the left 
is a very important pathway. And uh, we know that metformin in the brain seems to work mostly on that pathway, not on the other pathway in translational control. So that's what we found. And then in the next slide, you will see, so we started with a, 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 a behavior that's called grooming. And grooming is a repetitive behavior, which is in the autism spectrum disorder. So what it does, if you look at uh, the little mouse figure down there, it's actually, it's the mouse, licks itself, cleans itself. And what we see in lots of autism spectrum disorders and in fragile X is that they overdo the licking and the cleaning. And in some even, some of our mass models, they do it so hard that they actually hurt themselves. So if you look at the graph above, and that's going to be for all the graphs you're going to see, the blue is a metformin treated uh, a knockout model, which is the model for fragile X. And the black is the knockout model. So you see, and the and the, the gray is the wild type model. So you see that there's an increase in grooming. The black is much higher than the gray. But then if we treat them with metformin over several weeks, the blue shows much down a decrease of grooming and it goes back to normal, uh, normal behavior. Next so we, Ilse, we have about a minute or so left. Oh. We can maybe run over by a few minutes, but not much. Okay. okay. Social novelty, it's a, it's, a, it's a social behavior. So we find differences there. And again, we find uh, that we get a, uh, a rescue or a correction uh, with, uh, with the drug. So next one. Nesting behavior, uh, Patricia called that in. So it's actually an impairment in social withdrawal. Again, we find a um, a correction in the nesting behavior. Next slide. So very important and that's, uh, so we, we contacted uh, UC Davis, which is in California and we did uh, case studies in patients while we were doing the mouse studies and they got very good results with children and with adults, and now we have uh, clinical trials going uh, in three, two sites in Canada and one site in the States, and it's a double-blind placebo control, so I don't know the details yet because it's still ongoing and it's blind. But uh, very important is that we have a biobank uh, going, which will lead to biomarkers to predict what would be the best treatment for several, uh, several patients. So uh, that's going to be very exciting. Next slide. Uh, let's go over that slide because uh, we, we are short in time. Just quickly, um, we also have other models, like for instance, the uh, Shang-3 animals that are a filomidermid uh, syndrome. And we also see uh, there's uh, in that pathway I mentioned, there are impairments and we can also return that with metformin. So, and then the next slide. So, it corrects core deficits metformin. We have to wait in the patients with the placebo, but it looks like it's working very well. And what's good with metformin, and we're also testing other drugs like CBDs these days, like cannabinoids and all that, they can interfere with each other. And that's the, like Patricia mentioned that before, this is the way to go. It's not going to be one drug that is the treatment, but it's a combination of drugs. And in the next slide, it just shows the whole team that's been working on all these projects. So thank you. Thank you, Ilsa. And I apologize for uh, having you kind of rush through your work. It's such <laughs> nice work. And th there's actually a question for both you and Patricia, actually. Uh, someone's asking about GRIN1. So this is on the GLUN1 uh, subunit. Uh, they're wondering about some of these treatments that you've been discussing. Could, it, could they be useful, just like you were mentioning at the end, for the Shank 3 mouse and perhaps for other patients? other than fragile X, could the treatment such, a, such as with metformin, do you think it could have benefit for these other autistic disorders or neurodevelopmental disorders like GRIN? Well, it's, it could be. I think it would be very important, again, to look at the difference, like when I showed the pathway uh, status, we would have to look at the different pathway proteins and phosphorylated proteins differently. With phosphorylated proteins, I mean active proteins, but because those are the ones that are changed. We would have to look there and then 
see how it is upon green and it might be actually so right. uh, it's definitely worth a, tr worth a trial and um if uh if it's i'm not sure if it's a researcher or a parent who asked i think it may be a parent but but okay. what i was going to bring is bring patricia in because patricia has a lot of experience looking at a lot of drugs and 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 sometimes they've bypassed the preclinical work and gone straight into the clinical trial especially with drugs like metformin where the safety is pretty well known. So have you any thoughts on that, Patricia? Maybe just to share with the people who are in the green, uh, the cure green community that are, you know, hoping to jump, jump over uh, yeah. learning about all the pathology and maybe learning about how to go straight to a treatment or at least modifying disease. Well, uh, um, we, I, I think one of the most important things in uh, extrapolating from the mouse, because it's a mouse, you know, it's like a worm, a fly, it's a very useful tool, but it's still far away from humans. So we, we should put some expectations, but not all of them. Sure. And I think one of the things that are very important when we're running these trials, which I think was on the published paper, for example, of metforming, is that they use loads of biomarkers as well in parallel to, for right. example, in Fragile X syndrome, now we are running EEG uh, because we know that a specific EEG can be used in a human clinical trial. We are looking right. perifer for peripheral markers in the mouse that then it can be used in uh, clinical trials. And we are exploring, for example, the microbiome. So um, the, the, we have tested loads and loads and loads of compounds in the fragile X, Pete Hopkins, muscular dystrophy, and so on. And again, uh, some compounds will work, but maybe we need to explore more things when we are testing compounds in the mouse, just then, sure. oh, okay, it works, you know, in this set of behavioral assays, fantastic, let's go for it. And perhaps there are more things like the bri bryostatin one that you need to see the difference between an acute, a chronic, how chronic right. uh, the treatment should be, and I think combination studies. And, sure. and I think that is probably why some drugs, many drugs, do respond on the mice. And perhaps it's because they're touching different pathways that, you know. So exactly. I, I, I think she has also yeah. said. I agree with uh, Patricia, actually. And you're right, we're also doing the EEGs. Um, but uh, what we're also trying to do is to find similar markers in the blood of the mouse and the blood of patients, because we are we're a bit hands off when it comes to brain in patients, except sure. EEG and MRI is never always, we could do MRI, but it's lots of kids with ASD or with fragile X, they're so anxious that it's very hard to do MRI studies. So, uh, so EEG is much more calming and they can be trained to wear the cap and all that. Right. So, yeah. So I, I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm going to finish it there. So thanks very much to both of you for sharing. Very exciting work. It's gone from preclinical ideas into, um, uh, uh, you know, practice, maybe clinical practice in the future. The, just to give you an update, the, the person asking the question was a parent. So they're, I guess, of course, curious for their own kids, uh, how things. Uh, because of time, and we're actually really over time now, I, I'm going to stop the broadcast. But I want to thank again our two speakers. Thanks for jumping in in the last few days just to put this together. I really appreciate you doing that. So thanks again. And thanks for everybody for hanging in there despite all the little hiccups we had at the beginning. Thank you, Derek, for the invitation too. No problem. Thanks. Good to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.